Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Cross Canada checkup on April 14th. So, and we're very excited to have Dr. Matthew Hunt and Dr. Sean Cleaver join us today for their discussion on ethics and equity and COVID-19 considerations for physiotherapy. Now, for those of you who are new here, the Cross Canada checkup webinars are designed to really stimulate discussion with physiotherapists across the country and around the world to keep physiotherapists and rehab professionals up to date on COVID-19 and any of the research initiatives or resources that are coming out surrounding COVID-19. And my name is Phil Shepard and I host these sessions along with Dr. Mike Landry. And now we have Jenny Day who's also uh, helping us and she's coordinating these sessions going forward. So just to give you an update on the structure of the session, so we have a situation report from Mike Landry first, and then we have expert speakers who talk about a specific subject. So today with uh, Matthew and Sean, they'll be talking for around 15 minutes or so, and then it's followed with a Q&A session from the audience at the end. And these sessions on Tuesday are in collaboration with the CPA. So Mike and I will be moderating the session, and we'll be asking and voicing all the questions that you can, you're typing in the, um, in the chat or in the Q&A section at the bottom. So just so you know, we have these sessions at 7 p.m. Eastern time, three times a week. So they're on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays. And if you do wanna be part of the listserv or if you wanna share it, it's rehabcovid19 at gmail.com, and then we'll send out links from there. And just to let you know that Next week, we have um, an incredible guest coming in. So we have Dr. Alice Aiken, who is going to come in and talk about her experiences actually contracting COVID-19 and her experience, um, kind of how it was, the signs and symptoms, how it affected her, and the implications from both a physiotherapist and a professional perspective, but also as a patient to talk about what the role of physiotherapist could be and kind of the difficulties surrounding it. So that'll be an amazing session going forward. And just one last kind of housekeeping item before we get going is that when we do enter these meetings, we're kind of all entering it as physiotherapists and as rehab professionals with the common goal of sharing resources and sharing opinions and, um, and views and initiatives that are happening around the country. This is really a, an opportunity to network with professionals and colleagues and friends from around the country. And it's not really a platform for any organization or association to voice or, uh, or share their platform or share political views, but we are welcome to have different associations or organizations join us for future sessions where people can ask them questions directly. So with all that being said, all of that out of the way, I'll pass it over to Mike for a situation report. Great, thank you, Phil. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, all right, so um, for those of you, who are, I see there's quite a few people on today, so for those of you who are new to our, our, um, our sessions here, we usually start with a little bit of a cross-country checkup in terms of numbers, a situation report. So we go through some data that's from WHO, then we drill down to the Public Health Agency in Canada. And then I usually try to throw around a few ideas that have happened since the last time we met um, in terms of uh, new data. Uh, so here we have our current situation. Um, undoubtedly, you would be listening to the news, et cetera. Currently around the world, uh, 1,844,863 confirmed positive cases of COVID-19. 71,779 happened in the last 24 hours. Uh, the numbers continue to ramp up. Um, uh, the tragic numbers of the next one as well, which is 117,021 deaths around the world with uh, 5,369 happening in the last 24 hours. So the map that you have in front of you here are the cases um, reported uh, in the last uh, seven days. So you can see some countries, there we are, Canada over here, coming in the thousands. Uh, other nations, such as the United States, at a much higher um, 
case number reported. Th these are just absolute numbers and not ratios. So it just gives you, again, absolute numbers. Uh, what you may have seen um, in the last day or two was that uh, some countries, and I'll just notify or notice one, uh, Russia, which started off with almost no cases or no reported cases, now is becoming quite concerned. And so what we're uh, witnessing here is sort of maybe delayed effects in reporting, delayed effects in, um, you know, implementation, or maybe alternatively very hard implementation in the early days of the, the, the pandemic spread, and then a loosening of those particular measures, and then new cases have, have appeared. But the, the reason why I mention all this is I, I think we, we're still not 100% sure how this all plays out. Um, it's, it, there's no playbook on COVID-19 and the, 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 the spread that it is, that it is having. Uh, so you can see uh, countries of, of maybe particular interest, the Iran, which presented as one of the uh, real apex sites before, still struggling, still with very high numbers. Uh, West Africa, uh, well, across all of the continent of Africa, you see different types of numbers. Um, uh, you, you know, hard to understand if those are, you know, complete uh, pictures, but I will tell you that uh, Benin, which finds itself right here in West Africa, I have a very good colleague who is there, and um, he is reporting that the state is starting to loosen up uh, restrictions in certain parts. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. I think it's too early to start uh, saying what they are, but we're getting some trends, some things that are becoming a little bit more clear. Uh, as you, many of you know, I find myself in the United States right now, uh, where the, uh, the numbers and the politics are becoming pretty, pretty distressing. And so uh, we're all also seeing quite a bit of um, uh, a, a gap in in income and racial gap between uh, access to care and even uh, death rates. So there's quite a bit in re uh, retrospective that we'll all be looking at undoubtedly. Uh, let's um, drill down a little bit now into Canada. And uh, the, well, both uh, Dr. Hunt and Cleaver find themselves in, in Quebec. Um, so we'll come back around in Quebec, but and then maybe they can even share some of their, you know, even personal experiences, uh, guys, if, if, if you're interested and if you might, uh, because the numbers are pretty clear that uh, the province of Quebec is witnessing some of the highest rates, numbers, pace, et cetera. Um, it, it's not the only, but, but again, for the last few weeks, I've been sort of really highlighting how British Columbia seems to, to have done a few things that have curbed the, uh, the, uh, the, the escalating rates that it saw previously, but we still see in Quebec and Ontario uh, the highest um, total numbers. Uh, Canada now has 26,000 uh, reported, and um, there you go, you can see the different places um, uh, of, of uh, sort of the, the new numbers. Um, again, anyway, so, so I, I don't want to drill in too, too much into that. These are just big numbers, and, and I always remind ourselves that between, behind each one of those particular numbers is a person and a family. So um, um, I would say that Canada maintains, continues to do uh, well in its curbing, in my opinion, not anyone else's, in my opinion, especially if you were uh, making that assessment from the United States. Um, right. Okay. So <clears throat> I mentioned the, the, the point about uh, Russia now starting to identify publicly that they're becoming more concerned. I think a lot of discussion is now starting to un unravel in different countries, but I did come across this today. And this is, uh, you, you saw it's a CNN uh, report from this morning uh, where they talk about proning um, and the importance of proning uh, with COVID-19 patients, especially as it relates to oxygenation and pulmonary function. Um, you know, it, it, I'm not putting this here to, to teach anybody. I mean, my goodness, we, we've known this for a little while now. Uh, but what is interesting is that these kinds of techniques, which sort of fall within our scope, are becoming recognized. And so this, uh, in this article, I, it doesn't really mention uh, respiratory care, therapy, PT, but it does talk about how physicians are, are proning patients. Um, so, so, you know, anyway, I just think it's kind of interesting that some of the things that we do are now becoming really politically active ideas. Um, uh, in, a, in a later session of Cross Canada Checkup, we'll be talking about the impact on the profession with um, some of our leaders, um, at, including the CEO and the president. Uh, but the impact on the profession is quite profound. Um, but it is only as profound, I believe, as we let it to be. 
And so when we have some high line items like this starting to be discussed and it falls within what the profession does, I think it's, um, it's time to have some uh, really good discussion. So for instance, I would be issuing a uh, op-ed on this, uh, you know, by the time the day is over and get it pushed out as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm not, but I'm just suggesting somebody should. Uh, I'm going to end on this slide um, because um, it, it sort of um, sets in place where we're going with our guests here today. So uh, Matt and Sean, I know you're on the last time we talked about this, but I, I put up this slide here to talk about a framework for rationing ventilators and critical care beds. Um, uh, White and Lowe published this. They're located at the University of Pittsburgh, but some of their frameworks, which are predetermined scaling of potential for uh, uh, potential for um, uh, for for living uh, potential for restoration of function etc cetera, etc cetera. some of the known uh, factors and you know I think in each one of those uh, we have a bias that gets embedded in it and, and there's much value so so I'll, I'll stop there saying it is time to have these ethical and moral uh, paradox discussions and I'm, I'm so glad that both uh, Matt Hunt and Sean Cleaver agreed to be here with this today. So I'll end my session, my part of the session, and hand it back over to Phil to do a good introduction of our speakers. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And first, I just wanted to thank you all for being here and kind of being part of this community that we've developed uh, during COVID 19 and really contributing both during the sessions and outside of it. So we've received a lot of emails from people who have joined across the country and really around the world. and. Um, we're stronger because of it, and it's, it really helps to share the initiatives and resources with everyone. So thank you for being here. And so I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Matthew Hunt and Dr. Sean Cleaver to talk about ethics and equity in COVID-19, the considerations for physiotherapy. So Matthew Hunt is an associate professor and the director of research at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy of McGill University. He's also a researcher at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Rehabilitation and an associate member of the McGill Biomedical Ethics Unit and Institute for Health and Social Policy. Matthew conducts research at the intersection of ethics, rehabilitation, and global health. He co-leads the Humanitarian Health Ethics Research Group and McGill's Global Health Rehabilitation Initiative. So welcome, Matthew. Thank you for, for joining us today. And Thank you. then we have, uh, so Dr. Sean Cleaver. So Sean is a physiotherapist whose responsibilities focus on global health and equity. Since 2012, Sean's collaborations have primarily been in Zambia and previously worked to develop rehabilitation services in Haiti before and after the earthquakes in January 2010. So Sean's main affiliation is now a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill University. And he also has a secondary role as a director of community service learning at McGill, McGill's new Udoe Medical Campus. So welcome Matthew and Sean, and I'll pass it over to you to uh, lead the discussion. Thank you very much for that kind intro, Phil, and for getting us going, Mike. So it's now my turn to call up the slides. I spend a few hours on Zoom every single day, but I'm realizing that this is the first time that I've ever done a slideshow on here. So I am open to any of you guys correcting me if uh, I don't have a good setup. So just to check, there, there should be a slide that says ethics and equity in COVID-19. Thumbs up? Super. Okay. Let's get going. Let's get going. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, slideshow. Okay, so I, I have the responsibility for setting the landscape. We, we've set this up as a playbill today where Matthew and I will be alternating responsibilities. Uh, I'll start by identifying some of the foundations that we've established for our talk. Then Matthew will talk about some useful perspectives, especially related to equity, some considerations for physios, and then I'll, I'll take over again to look to advance our dialogue as we move into the question and answer period. So with respect to our approach today, I'll show homage to Montel Jordan and say that this is how we'll do it. 
some of the approaches to the session that might be different than the last ones that you've seen is that we are intentionally looking to blur and unblur the boundaries of physios. Thinking of our more traditional roles as clinicians, managers, entrepreneurs, and academics, yes, but also as our roles as constituents, voters, leaders, and advocates in the community. As a, a current physiotherapist and academic right now, I consider the physiotherapy community be, to be one that I'm involved in, as well as that in my neighborhood, as well as the global health community. And all of these do have an impact on the pandemic and its outcomes. So we do want to keep those in mind and especially bear in mind the ways that physiotherapy boundaries have been blurred in the last few months as we, we've taken on new roles discussed in this teleconference, for example, being involved in screening testing, in increased primary care roles, et cetera. This session will also be a bit more dialogue focused than past sessions where other presenters have talked to us a lot about things that they've done and shared those experiences. What we wanna do is to prompt reflection, deliberation, and discussion. And this segues into the time orientation. So as opposed to discussing activities already passed, we want to get people asking those questions now that are relevant for now, as well as asking questions now that are relevant for later, as well as prompting people to think about questions to ask later, because more and more issues will arise as we move forward in the pandemic progression. And also, I originally felt like calling this a warning, but I'll actually now think of it as a welcome. This content will be a bit more social science-y than the past sessions on this forum, and we hope to bring you into this world. But as Matthew and I were preparing, we realized that some of our material might look contradictory on its surface. It requires a, a bit more thinking and discussion to realize what the common threads are. So welcome into this world. Making some links from some previous sessions, Mike again in the sit rep today talked about how, especially in the US, how there is notable differential mortality according to the, the race of, of people. How, using the examples from Chicago, Detroit, and Louisiana, where people of color make up 20, 30, 40% of the population, or at 70 to 80% of the deaths, to be specific on how that's working out numerically. That being one issue discussed here that clearly relates to our topic of equity and ethics today. We, we've also spoken about the possibility of moving to more telerehabilitation and telehealth delivery uh, for what we do as physios. I've been reminded by colleagues that this shows a lot of potential, but maybe not for folks who live in places where internet bandwidth is limited, expensive, slow for people who have less access to this. So although this creates opportunities, those opportunities can be differential, which opens up some equity and ethics issues. We had the good fortune of being joined by colleagues internationally who not only brought forth the issue of there being concerns, and Mike reminds us regularly about how the pandemic is playing out in different parts of the world, and we all cringe for when the numbers of infections start to go up in places like those where I work in Africa. But our colleagues emphasized how physiotherapists from the global south, from South America, from Africa, from Asia can be providing us with input and ideas here in Canada to restabilize this flow that we normally think of of information only going from rich world countries to poor world countries. I'd like to put that on the table as being an equity and ethics issue discussed here. And then in addition to that, we, we talk regularly about the impacts of distancing, be it social or physical. Where we've spoken about how the pandemic can seem a lot like disaster management, where sometimes striving for the perfect might seem like the enemy of the good enough when we're rushed, when we need to make fast decisions. But sometimes those fast decisions can prove to be negative in the long run. So we're, we're hoping to change the speed a little bit today in terms of focusing some reflection that we can be more confident that we're making the right decisions. And we've also talked in this forum about the connection of for-profit and public institutions with some questions about uh, how that might be done well or not. So you'll notice that on our slides today that we're drawing upon the metaphor of lenses for each one of our respective focuses. I'm going to draw more upon the lens of equity, whereas Matthew will draw more upon ethics. That, that revolves the, 
that relates to the ways that um, each one of us comes to these issues. But the two of us work together very closely. Matthew's actually my postdoc supervisor. So although we per hope to present complementary perspectives, they're fairly close together when you think about the breadth of what we talk about in terms of physiotherapists. We also have bandied around the idea of using the metaphor of these being tools. Equity and ethics are ideas, but they can be useful. Useful as a way to look at things, as lenses. But tools, just like the tools in physiotherapy of exercise prescription or manual therapy or breathing exercises are, are tools that we use in our profession. These are tools that the two of us use regularly. So my focus is more about equity. If you're really interested about equity, there are lots of definitions of it. And those of us who work with equity talk about how these different definitions can be applied and thought about for, for useful purposes, but we're not gonna go that deep today. What I would like to do is provide an understanding of equity in the reverse by defining it in terms of health inequities. One easy but useful way to think about this is differences in health outcomes that are unfair and unjust and could be reasonably redressed if there's attention put to them. Now, Mike had asked us to reflect or to maybe talk about the situation here in Quebec. For, for those who have been exposed to the news, uh, a lot of our deaths here in Quebec have been occurring in long-term care centers and nursing homes. And that provides a useful example on how to differentiate differences in health outcomes that are not due to equity issues and those that are due to health inequities. It is a function of biology that mortality, the mortality of this disease can be related to age and that older people die more. That's biology, that's fair, that's not an equity issue. By contrast, if we set society up to send older people to nursing homes and then opt to not provide them the resources that they need, that is something that is unfair, it is unjust, and it can be redressed. This is an issue of health inequity. Now, to think more about this lens that I'm talking about of equity and some tools that are useful to it, I'll draw upon two from the physiotherapy community, both of them published on by my uh, PhD supervisor, Stephanie Nixon at the University of Toronto. The, the first one, a seven step framework for critical analysis and its application in the field of physical therapy, fits under the umbrella of critical approaches. And I'll, I'll draw attention to the meaning of critical a little bit here, because I'm using the word in a sense that's different from critical care and different from critical appraisal, two ways that are more commonly used in the physiotherapy profession. And instead, I'm thinking about critical philosophy. Unfortunately, there's that homophone or homonym that can lead to confusion in the biomedical sciences. But critical approaches are ones where we're thinking about the assumptions that underlie what we think of as being true, the things that we take for granted. And we ask questions about who benefits and who is disadvantaged by certain approaches. And those three questions, those three issues that I've brought attention to here are three of the seven step framework for critical analysis in this publication, Physical Therapy, written by Stephanie Nix and colleagues from the University of Toronto. Uh, unfortunately, we were scheduled to do a workshop on using this framework at Congress in May, led by Lisa Arcabelli with a few other, uh, few other colleagues. And as we know, that, that has been canceled. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk more about that in some other education platform. But nonetheless, I bring that to your attention as being a useful, practical way to use a critical approach to think about health equity, asking questions about the assumptions that lie behind things and asking questions about who's benefiting, who's disadvantaged by certain approaches. Another one also from Stephanie Nixon recently published is useful for us to think of how in society we allocate privileges and disadvantage or oppression. And Dr. Nixon has presented the metaphor of a coin being a useful way to think about these systems of inequalities. And one thing that I'll draw your attention to with respect to this coin is that when we are in situations of privilege, we tend not to see how things are from the side of disadvantage or oppression. 
So this paper was written to help those of us, and I'll use myself as an exa example, as a white man who benefits from patriarchy because of being a man, who benefits from white supremacy and racism because of being white, that I often don't see those systems at play. They therefore make it possible for me to ignore health equities be because of my privilege. So I put those on the table as being useful tools to help us apply the lens of equity and think about this more in terms of our role as physiotherapists writ large in the COVID-19 pandemic. The last thing, Phil did mention earlier that this forum is not meant to be a platform for any particular group, but I will draw your attention to two because they're, they're fairly new creations in the physiotherapy profession and they give opportunities for us to talk about these things that are generally not discussed as much as they could be. One is the Critical Physiotherapy Network, an international platform run mostly online, easy to find by Uncle Google. And another one specific to Canada is the Equity in Canada Facebook group. This is a closed group. Uh, you can look us up and ask to join. If you are a physiotherapist in Canada, you will be invited. With those points, I'll now turn it over to Matthew. Give me a second here, Matthew, to unshare. Sounds good, John. Stop sharing. I think that leaves it open for you. I'm hoping that that will allow me to share the screen. I don't see the slides come up, though. Can you see uh, slides for me? I see a black and white band. It looks like a piece of art in the National Gallery, actually. But, uh... <laughs> okay, I don't know what that is. I'm going to try that again. Apologies. If worse comes to worse, Matthew, okay, we can operate from, from my screen. Well, Oh, there we go. That, that looks better. Excellent. You can see slides now? All it's right. not on slideshow mode, but uh, we can see your PowerPoint file. There How we go. About that now. Thank you for your patience. Um, great. Well, thank you, Sean. I, uh, I like the way you set that up. I'm going to take up the second lens that Sean described and thinking about equity and ethics very much as complementary and mutually reinforcing lenses that help draw our attention to issues, concerns, preoccupations, that particularly relates to our values, uh, as Sean said, as citizens, as professionals, and maybe especially here as, as physiotherapists. Um, the first observation that I'd like to make is that this situation, I think in a very tangible way, is drawing our attention or drawing to the foreground issues of ethics in our everyday lives in a way that we don't usually think about. Like how many reports have you read, conversations have you had that are about sacrifices that are, people are making on behalf of others, acts that people are taking that are other-minded. And I wanna suggest that people have pointed to the idea of other-mindedness, so being attentive to a sense of responsibility towards others as being the heart of ethics. And we're seeing this in all sorts of tangible ways in our neighborhoods, in our communities, um, and in our families, ways that people are sort of living out uh, that idea of other-mindedness. At the same time, so this idea of ethics being at center uh, and at the heart of a lot of what is uh, going on in our, our current situation, at the same time, we're faced with a set of societal, institutional, professional questions that are fundamentally about ethics. So beyond this question of other-mindedness, we are asking questions uh, that are about ethics or that have an ethical component, have um, nuance or hue that relates to ethics. And so we need other sorts of approaches for thinking about like, what is the ethics behind that? How do we frame it up as ethics? I'd like to introduce this uh, articulation from Paul Ricard. Uh, in the original, he says, la visée de l'éthique et la vie bonne avec et pour autrui dans des institutions justes. So the aim of ethics is the good life with and for others in just institutions. And I, 
I like this and I want to put it forward because I think it captures a few things. I like that it's couched as an ethical posture orientation. It's suggesting ethics is something that we're aiming towards, that we're striving uh, to achieve. It emphasizes notions of the good life. Like what does it mean? People are gonna understand that differently, different circumstances, they inhabit different contexts, even in the context of a lockdown, uh, what might we consider the good life? It's fundamentally relational. It's about uh, you know, emphasizing with and for others. And then it acknowledges issues of justice and fairness in the institutions that we inhabit, that we circulate in, that we practice in. So our relationships and even our conceptualizations of what the good might be is shaped in all sorts of tangible ways. So our, our ethical lens might draw attention to the relationships, might draw attention to the institutions, and might draw attention to the very conceptions of what we mean by the good and the values that are held within that. I don't know if Phil and Mike are familiar with Hugo Slim, but people who are engaged in work related to uh, humanitarian action, I would really recommend looking him up. I would describe him as the most interesting author thinking about ethical issues in the humanitarian space. And coming off of uh, many years of work as a senior policy advisor for the International Committee of the Red Cross, he had some really interesting things to share about his ideas of emergency ethics that we could take from the humanitarian context and then think about more broadly in the context of COVID-19 at a more global level. Um, so this is, this is part of what he's written. He really emphasizes four takeaways. Uh, the first uh, really is the notion that, you know, we talk a lot about our rights and even human rights, and he emphasizes that we also have corollary human duties. And the second was to get the ethics right, we really need strong ethical leadership. His third point is to recognize that the burdens don't fall equally. And this is maybe to Sean's point, to really be carefully attentive to the ways in which burdens are distributed and how we can, uh, our efforts to mitigate those. And that has two sides, people who take on burdens based on their professional obligations, and then also people in marginalized positions who might experience vulnerability because they are at risk because of how they're situated. And then the fourth call that he makes is really towards virtuous action. So he makes this point that the, the front line of the pandemic, as he puts it, lies around us and within each of us. So his last idea there about the virtues that the situation calls us towards. Mike had introduced, uh, he had that slide, white and low, and their recent commentary about triage, uh, criteria, triage, um, policies essentially that have been set up, frameworks. There are several ethical issues that are gaining the most attention and rightly so. Like we're hearing a lot about those issues of resource allocation, questions of justification of just how we calibrate the sorts of public health measures that are appropriate in this context, issues related to clinical practice, both for patients with COVID-19, but for other patients too. How do we uh, strike due balances in terms of trying to address people's needs and also with these public health imperatives of preventing contagion and trying to uh, minimize the implications for society at large. And then also questions of research ethics. We're sort of like in this space where these are all live discussions and they intertwine in ways that might not normally be apparent. Any journal that you pick up, any professional journal, uh, currently you're gonna see articles that are asking questions of the current situation and framed up in regards to ethics. Um, that is a primary place of the discussion. And I think as physiotherapists, we're situated within lots of these uh, discussions, right? Like these are relevant to us. What happens in terms of triage? What happens in terms of public health measures? How does that play out? Even questions of, of research. And it's perhaps a particularly interesting question for us today, given our focus, is to also wonder, you know, what might be distinctive about uh, the experience of physiotherapists or ways in which this might be relevant. Uh, you know, it might be questions uh, that are not here listed. I think people will have other things that they want to share too or have reflections. Responsibilities as an employer, Sean mentioned something about uh, entrepreneurs and, and clinic owners. As an educator, I feel responsibilities to students, clinical trainees in the physiotherapy and occupational therapy program. All of these are questions that we need to think out 
um, and have a response to. So if we take up, so we've introduced the equity lens, we've introduced the ethics lens, and then we try and orient our, our reflection towards physio physiotherapy more specifically. Um, we'll, we'll flag a few things with the caveat that this is just a, a starting place. And before I, I go even further, I, I wanna ask some questions about clinical care right now. Ask the questions also about like, how do we anticipate what comes next and even be thinking about that. And then a particular issue about equity and disability. I think there's two starting places uh, that might be helpful for us as physiotherapists. And, and the first one is to emphasize the way in which we have an obligation to advance the health of populations, one patient at a time. Or to put that a different way, and something that might not be as obvious in normal times, is that we have uh, responsibilities to the collective and to the individual that are intertwined. And the second is the importance of nurturing our ethical sensitivity. And what I mean by that are our capacities to reflect, to deliberate, to identify how our values are played out in our practices and also potentially threats to living out the values of our professions, our ethical commitments in the context of our practice. So one way we can think about that is to ground ourselves and actually what are our ethical commitments or responsibilities. So it seems like a natural thing to pull up the Code of Ethical Conduct, the CPA. On the left, you see some pretty standard articulations and principles of uh, healthcare ethics. And on the right, an articulation of actually values, some of those things that we aim to uphold. And we could ask about um, ask yourselves, how do they help orient us, provide moral bearings in the current landscape? So if we're thinking about clinical care currently, uh, from Sean's description of previous discussions, these are live issues. Like what does it look like for current hospital-based care, for current care in home settings or other settings that are deemed essential or urgent, and then also care provided uh, remotely, I think that the range of, uh, like if we use uh, the perspective of those principles and values, we might start to be able to, to think about questions like, what might it mean to promote well-being of patients in this context? How do we try and uh, both mitigate the risks while also seeking to um, optimize or maximize the benefits for patients? Some of the questions about justice that are articulated there might ask us to look at, are we being consistent in applying the same approach to patients in similar circumstances? As we move into more remote uh, approaches, tele-rehabilitation, as was mentioned before, I think often we think, okay, this is just a question of having secure platforms and proper encryption. But are we really thinking through what does it mean to, for example, uh, think about professional boundaries in that context. What sort of articulation and transparent discussion of risks are necessary with patients? How do we manage uh, reports and documentation in our home environments or ensure privacy of the interaction at both ends with patients in, the, in these settings? So these are the sorts of questions that we might need to ask um, with equity guiding our consideration of if there are people who are at particular risks in different ways. There are uh, resources that people could also turn to that I just like to flag, thinking about more tangible tools, as Sean put it, that as people encounter ethically challenging situations, and those might well be the case, there are a number of uh, resources. Here is one example of decision-making tools developed for ethics. Um, I point to this one, it's one that we developed, but trying to think, taking more generic approaches to ethical decision-making, and then asking ourselves the question, what was specific to rehabilitation? So if you're interested and you uh, look at the paper in more detail, trying to think about like, what does it mean to think about function? What does it mean to think about environments in which people uh, are active? What does it mean to think about discrimination or other types of uh, barriers that people might experience? So these are the sorts of tools that uh, you could also turn to in clinical practice. And then the second piece is also uh, one that I know many people are already turning towards or thinking about. And those are issues uh, about what happens next. 
And as we phase back up or as we move into uh, what might be described as a recovery period, I know the city of Montreal today was talking about uh, their policy, a relaunch policy. And I thought that was an interesting uh, way of phrasing it. But what, what might a relaunch policy look like or approach? Have we done, uh, like how can we do the advanced work to anticipate that at the level of clinics or at the level of PT departments or more broadly in the profession? So that as we're thinking about that, we're taking into consideration some of these uh, aspects of equity and ethics as we resume services. So one of the specific examples that I might mention, Sean was asking the question like, or pointing to the fact that tele-rehab might not be available for certain people because of where they live, or access to technology. And an equity question might be, well, should there be some way, there's gonna be a huge amount of need uh, as we resume services and how do we prioritize people in that context? Within the context of adopting a tele-rehab approach, should we prioritize people who weren't able to participate in, in that sort of approach? We have a lot of experience in terms of managing wait lists, wait lists in different contexts. We can draw upon that. Um, the point that Sean was making too about learning from elsewhere, uh, people who have experience dealing with resource limitations, we might learn from other countries that are ahead of us on the COVID curve as well. Uh, one of the projects that we're currently putting into place is to look at multiple countries from the perspective of how people are responding in light of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and how using that as an indicator evaluating policies related to uh, disability in these different contexts. On the right, what I put there was a tool that is being used broadly in the current context for thinking about how do we address issues of procedural justice in setting policies in the context of scarcity. And so that sort of approach where we're thinking not just about how do we establish the parameters, but are we thinking about participation and transparency and other concerns that more about how we implement decisions and make decisions, that might be a helpful lens for us to think about as well. The third thing that I wanted to introduce, the final one, uh, was also a particular concern that we might have as physiotherapists, given our expertise in rehabilitation. And that relates to uh, the needs of people with disabilities in the context of COVID-19. So I think this is a particularly uh, important issue for us, not the only one, but an important one as physiotherapists. Uh, we're seeing, we talked about statistics before, some of the statistics from New York, are that people with disabilities living in group home contexts are probably, well, the New York stats were up to five times more likely to have COVID-19 and up to five times more likely to die from COVID-19 than other people affected uh, by COVID-19. At the same time, so there's those issues about disproportionate risk, and I might make this distinction between people being vulnerable in this context and also people being made vulnerable in the context. And there, um, some of the questions are about triage protocols and things like it. So there have been questions raised about, are there things in the way that we're conceiving of triage protocols that might, uh, for example, there are some states in the US that have included categorical, categorical denials of people with certain conditions from being considered eligible to receive certain scarce resources. And more close to home, um, there are those questions about triage protocols. There are also other sorts of concerns related to policy situations. So here's an example from Ontario um, on Monday, asking questions about uh, shuttering the assistive devices programs and the processing of new uh, requests for assistive devices and the implications that that would have, particularly for people with disabilities. So as physiotherapists and using that idea of allyship, we might have a role in asking some of these questions or thinking about ways that the current situation might disproportionately affect people with disabilities and do we have an opportunity to, to respond in that regard. Uh, I thought one of the really encouraging things that I saw yesterday was that Canada has actually formed a new disability advisory group. So Minister Qualtro has formed a new group and I think another piece of procedural justice relates to inclusion and participation. And that might be uh, the sort of example that uh, hopefully we'll see in different contexts where there is more responsiveness and outreach in terms of involving people in decision-making processes. And I will stop there and turn it back to you, 
Sean. Okay. Uh, as you know from our playbill from earlier, I do have the spot to talk for a few minutes here. And I've decided to use the somewhat awkward looking mixed metaphor of flattening the loose ends for the, this last little bit. The, the reason why I am referring to that is the, the mixed metaphor that looks a bit awkward and confusing is intentional. This is a situation that we are still actively figuring out. And the image that you see on this slide would be familiar to others who are in Quebec. Uh, this is our National Director of Public Health, Horacio Aguda, who, like Bonnie Henry, like Teresa Tam, has become a bit of a star in the last little while, uh, such that there are t-shirts being made of them. Sort of another sign of how bizarre a time this is. So for my last few minutes, I will move a bit more quickly than I did before. My initial plan was to talk for five minutes at a time to myself. I spoke for 12, and I think that's emblematic of our situation right now. Uh, I've calculated that today is the start of the fifth week that I've been hanging out in this room for approximately 12 hours a day, and I know that I'm not alone in that. Again, to reinforce that this is a strange time for which many of us are looking forward to being allowed to come out of our houses and get back to life as normal, quote unquote. Although I think we all know deep down that things will not be the same when uh, this acute phase is over. I draw your attention to that because the effects of the pandemic will undoubtedly be bad in some ways, but might be positive in some ways. I mentioned earlier that part of what we we're hoping to do today is to break down the distinction between physiotherapists and for us professional and other roles of ourselves as people. And one that I did not draw enough attention to was the very real roles of us as individuals who are just trying to make our way through this situation. Matthew had mentioned as one of Hugo Slim's points with respect to disaster ethics, that the ethics is around us, but also in each of us. And I bring that up in part to Mike and Phil to maybe encourage you to have a session on self-care or something similar uh, in this forum at some point. Self-care is an idea that I originally poo-pooed thinking that it was a little bit nar narcissistic, that those of us in positions of privilege might take that much time to think about ourselves. And this pandemic has been another reason for me to identify the ways that we experience these things and that our personal experience can then influence what we're able to do. As challenging as the isolation period has been for me, one of the biggest things that I've realized is that with the cancellation of many events, that I've been kind of relieved. And I will be quite overt in recognizing that my situation without having any dependents, either children or elderly parents, makes this a lot easier for me than I'm sure many of the people who are on this session today. But I'll end on that note, encouraging us to take this opportunity to dialogue, which I'm using as a verb, to discuss about our situations and to, and to think about how that leads to the different actions that we can pursue as physiotherapists in all the senses. Unfortunately, since this is a, a webinar, that makes it a bit more difficult for us to have verbal exchanges with all the participants, but we welcome your questions in the Q&A period, and you can probably tell, having had a, a chance to meet the four of us, that we have no difficulty talking when given the microphone but hopefully that we'll be able to find many other opportunities as physiotherapists to connect, especially in this time of social isolation, because we, we do need this dialogue. There's some final information on Matthew and I, we're fairly easy to find on Google um, in our associations with McGill University. Thank you very much, everybody. Incredible. Thank you very much, Matthew and Sean, for, uh, for, for bringing up such an important topic.
Now I'll, um, I'll open up the floor for questions there. Um, so if you do have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A session, section at the bottom and uh, myself or Mike will read them out for you. But um, just to, as people are thinking about that, I, uh, I mean, I know I learned a lot from this, um, which is which I'll also be carrying forward to uh, other um, humanitarian situations that I'm in. And I like the the points you brought up about the the ethical considerations and the, the disaster kind of being all around us. And I think that's something that that has been um, really eye opening and and unique in this type of situation. So I know I'll bring I'll bring that forward. Um, now we, there was a suggestion, now you, you mentioned the, uh, the aspect of self-care, and I know um, both of you have worked in global health for quite a long time. Now, do you have any uh, suggestions on who to invite in or who to um, have for a session on that? Uh, I'll, I'll build on the uh, Q&A bubble with respect to that comment from uh, Jennifer O'Neill, University of Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Rachel Thibault, as being one of our professional colleagues, occupational therapist who was a longtime faculty at the University of Ottawa, as being an all-star in terms of how we can devote our energies to help improve the situation of others and to think about our own situation at the same time. She, she tends to be a, a fairly busy woman for good reason. But in, in terms of people who I would love to have this type of discussion with, and I'll go to the next point too, about doing these, these sessions on Zoom in more of an interactive format. I am really happy to CPA for sponsoring these webinars and making them available. I think that we have an opportunity to be alternating between the webinar style format and the more interactive ones. And I, I could see the self-care session being more amenable to interaction that allows easier discussion. I would strongly endorse the suggestion that Rachel Thibault would be a great person to talk about that. Um, that that's great. I think it, I think actually it does like, obviously that's just a general issue, right? Like self-care in this context in moments of stress. And we all need to be thinking about that. And I would encourage too, that there might be a place where uh, like, how does, how does that play out in terms of the ethical dimensions? Um, there are ways in which, like there are ways that we think about like really challenging decisions when people or teams face those. Sometimes we talk about moral residue, like that there is something that even when we do our best and we've thought it through, we still feel uncomfortable. There's this lingering sense that something of, you know, something isn't fully resolved. And so self-care is part of that, but also I would say team care. So a lot of uh, work around this could also be done in the context of teams. Um, that's an issue of like making space, uh, there, you know, the idea of like, how do you create space in teams to be able to share these challenging experiences and then also to offer supports to each other. Um, when we've looked at ethical issues in the context of challenging crisis situations, consistently what people tell us is that <laughs> the most important source of support are their colleagues and the people on their team. The flip side of that is, the hardest situations are the ones in which they feel isolated from their team or their team is dysfunctional, right? So the team can be the strongest source of support, but also sometimes a source of ethical challenge. But I would encourage us, even thinking about this challenging time and as colleagues, how do we work together to support each other from the perspective of our well-being and also from supporting us in, in making these ethical reflect, you know, liberating and making ethical decisions. I see Diana has a question, so I'll, I'll read it out in a minute, but, um, or just a second, but one of the things, um, I agree, uh, but where do you, the two of you see sort of, um, the ability to control one's own environment as a powerful tool to self care. Um, so in other words, uh, when you lose power and, and I don't just mean as a clinician, although that might be the case, but you know, people in these scenarios are losing power around their lives. They're not sure. Um, so, so where do you see like one's ability to externalize one's power? And then just a very, very quick answer. And then we'll go to Diana. Sean, did you I, want to start? Nah, I, I, I don't, I don't have a quick answer for that. 
I, I do think about how much we talk about empowerment and global health and ask questions as to whether or not it's possible for one person to empower another. And I think about the idea of allyship that encourages us when we're in positions of privilege that one of the first things we can do is just step back to give other people opportunities. And I, I also think about, I, since I've been sitting at home alone, I, I've been thinking about my own situation and the pre-pandemic stress and anxiety that I was facing and trying to figure out how to come out the other side of this so that this is different, so that we do not reinforce the same problems that brought us into this pandemic situation in the first place. Societally, we, we had lots of issues as a group of uh, issues we're talking about, right? Like, so the things that are happening in the ICU and the triage allocation decisions, that's not going to be the case. There are other places where physiotherapists and other rehabilitation professionals are thinking about what happens for individual patients when, you know, there are important ethical questions probably about discharging patients and about the types of care that people are receiving, issues related to uh, security and safety of staff and of others and how that relates to patient safety. So one of my reflections about rehabilitation ethics generally, like often where we, place the attention, including in the current context for ethical issues in healthcare, generally at the beginning of life and at the end of life, and there hasn't been a lot of space for talking about rehabilitation ethics. My impression of rehabilitation ethics generally, the hardest and most persistent questions that I've seen come up are about managing risk. So a lot of the ethical issues I'm going to choose to answer her question one as well. Seeing as our current role as a physiotherapist in a bigger than oneself lens at the moment, how can we improve our reach for the most vulnerable population? And the answer that I would give to that is that we can mainstream this as an issue. Think about how often we as physiotherapists think about our scope of practice. Like that's great. That's a really helpful response. I like the idea as an ethical capacity of foresighting. Also, so how do we not just uh, you know see the things that are coming, but also like really invest the think work and the imaginative work? Like, what are the ways that what could things be, and how do we achieve those goals? How do we sustain these partnerships? That's great. Like what's happening now that we've spent an hour that 38 people uh, have been part of the conversation 
uh, is really important for making that happen. Sorry, just just trying to unmute myself there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yes, I do think this is a, a very important conversation, and uh, we're extremely lucky to have both of you join us and share your expertise on this. So. Um, I'd just like to thank you for coming in and thank everyone for joining us. And there was a um, Um, another plug next week, Alice Aiken talking about her personal experience with COVID-19, not theory, uh, real. Uh, so we look forward to uh, as many people as possible. Please sp uh, spread the word. And uh, Matt and Sean, thanks again. Great presentation. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined. Good night, everybody. Or good evening if you're in the West. It's all posted too, isn't it? Isn't it posted on the CPA website? So if you if you feel inclined to like get them and answer them, we can certainly have that posted or something. If that's what you're thinking. Uh, yeah, I, I am thinking that, and it, it was really nice to see the questions come in at the end. We we were hoping to find ways to stimulate people to send their questions earlier, and we we ended up not pulling it off. But um, that people still did it, like. 10, five minutes before the end makes me really excited. And I, I hope that I can contribute to the process of finding ways of encouraging that interaction.